Welcome everybody to the final webinar in this current Advancing Leadership webinar series. And today we are looking at the topic of common leadership challenges and solutions. So I'm delighted to have so many of you with us. This is actually a, a record turnout for this series and delighted also to welcome our two panelists. So I'm joined today by Ibrahim Al-Zubi, who's joining us from Dubai. Um, Ibrahim is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Majid Al-Futame. He's also a Senior Associate of CISL and our Ambassador for the region. Um, Ibrahim has been with Majid Al-Futame for nearly 10 years and as Chief Sustainability Officer reports directly into the CEO. I'm also delighted to welcome Gillian Secret, Gillian recently joined CISL as our Director of Leadership Programs, and that follows a 22-year um, career at the Muller Center where she was CEO. So delighted to have um, our panelists with us today. A few technical details before we kick off. We have had a phenomenal amount of questions received in advance of this webinar. I think we've had over 60 questions, so thank you for those. You also are able to ask questions and add comments via the chat function during this webinar. Um, our goal will be to get to as many of those questions as, part, as possible, so please, please do ask questions. As I mentioned, this is the last webinar in the current Advancing Leadership series. And the others in this series, if you're able to join us in March, we looked at personal leadership in action and last month communicating for leadership influence and in action. Um, so delighted to um, pick up this topic. And just a note that you'll also get in the um, email that we send you afterwards. All our webinar series recordings are available on our leadership hub and information about all of our leadership programs can be found on our website as well. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce the five challenges that we're going to address um, in the next 30 minutes. <clears throat> and the point to make is these have all very much been crowdsourced by our community. So these are the challenges that come up most regularly, both um, in our online and face-to-face -face programs and through our network of, of 9,000 alums around the world. Um, so we thought it was mo most appropriate for the last in this current Advancing Leadership webinar that we handed over to you and actually addressed the challenges that are most pertinent for you in your context. So these are the following. One, of course, responding to the pandemic. Two, how do we line our, align our personal and organizational purpose to create value for stakeholders. Challenge three, how do we unlock innovation and finance for a sustainable economy? Challenge four, that old chestnut, how do we get buy-in from the board for long-term goals? And challenge five, how do we break through gridlock to influence change both within our organizations and beyond? So those are the five challenges that we're gonna be covering off. And in terms of the format, just to say that we will limit the, the initial conversation to about 30 minutes so that we've got 30 minutes to get to as many of your questions as possible. So with no further ado, I would like to just um, introduce Ibrahim, who is going to respond to the first challenge, responding to the pandemic. But first, I wanted to ask Ibrahim just to spend a couple of minutes telling us a little bit about uh, Majid al for, for those of you who, who may not know the organization. So over to you, Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, Zoe. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of uh, this webinar. And I hope you'll all find uh, uh, today's session informative. And I hope each uh, one of you with the families as well are well and safe. Uh, Majid al uh, was founded in 1992 uh, is a leading shopping mall, uh, communities, retail, and leisure pioneer across the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Uh, it's a really remarkable business story, uh, started by one man's uh, vision to transform the face of shopping, entertainment, uh, and leisure to create great moments for everyone every day. Uh, it has since, since uh, 1992 till now, it's uh, grown uh, to one of the UAE's uh, most respected and successful businesses uh, spanning into 16 international uh, markets 
and employing more than 44,000 people uh, and, Tony, and uh, obtaining the highest uh, credit rating, triple B rating, uh, among privately uh, held uh, corporates in the region, as well as uh, the first region, uh, the first company in the region to get two ESG rated uh, company, uh, MSCIA and low risk as per sustainalytics. Uh, we own and operate uh, around 27 shopping malls, 13 hotels, and four mixed use uh, communities as part of our properties business. Also, we um, have a, a portfolio of uh, retail uh, where we uh, own a supermarket brand Carrefour in a number of markets across the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, uh, operating almost a portfolio of uh, more than 300 outlets. Also, we operate uh, more than 500 Vox cinema screens and uh, leisure entertainment from Magic Planet as well as uh, finance, consumer finance and uh, home uh, consumers and fashion as well as uh, FMB and uh, uh, having uh, representing brands such as the Lego store in the region. That's our uh, brand family uh, just uh, in, in brief and uh, uh, happy now to take you through the first challenge. Thanks Ibrahim, uh, over to the first challenge. Thank you. Uh, what I've learned, to, to be honest with you, in the last two or three months uh, through living and still managing on a personal and professional level the pandemic that we are living in is to be resilient and agile. It's an experience that uh, I learned and think day by day, as well as I've witnessed how companies and corporates that uh, agile and resilient uh, corporates took this into con consideration, the big difference uh, that uh, they made either by investing in uh, planet and the planet and the profit and the people as well. So one of the things, one of the good examples about the agility and resilience in, in, in addition to the in, uh, health and, and uh, environment and safety that we implement is something I, it's close to my heart, our investment in people. If you invest, if you're a people company, then you're an agile and a resilient company. A good example, when uh, we had to shut down our Vox cinema screens, uh, leisure entertainment outlets, uh, instead of, we made a commitment that we have a commitment for our people. We will not let them down, not only keeping them in the job or maintaining their monthly income, but also having keeping their pride by giving back to the business, giving back to the company, to the, com to the, to, to the community as well. So we did in, in such a record time, a match for time reskilled and redeployed more than 1,000 employees from our leisure entertainment, our cinemas, to help in our retail business, where we, they were under pressure then, and still because of people demanding more online, digital uh, platforms to get their uh, consumers' goods uh, delivered to them. That was a great, uh, and still a great uh, experience that showed our value, the togetherness. So it showed how we can come together as a company and how can to be agile. The other big example I would like uh, to uh, touch on is uh, the planet. This is something, it's an ongoing business. It doesn't stop with a pandemic or not. It's something you start now or yesterday and you think of the future, assuming, and if you're a climate change expert, you know we may are heading into a crisis or into maybe an environmental uh, climatic pandemic. So what we've done is we thought of the future and we did. We have the responsibility to give more to the environment more than we take. In an easy step, we calculated our negative environmental impact. We found it that it's, it's carbon and water. And we said by 2040, we want to be a net positive in carbon and water. This includes embedding uh, climate change risk assessment and modeling in our strategy and priority. This worked a lot, uh, uh, in, in, uh, helped a lot into the design and changing the mentality of the way we run business. If something we learned from COVID-19 is business as usual is officially dead. What we, do, what we need to introduce is a new sustainable business model. If you look at history with the industrial revolution, so we looked into amazing, huge shifts and now we are living the fourth industrial revolution. We're talking about digital, we're talking about AI, we're talking about uh, new things that we, we've never mentioned a couple 
of years ago. I would add, uh, as a wrap up to this challenge, if you want to have a successful for IR, for input industrial revolution, you definitely need to be agile and resilient. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, so I'd now like to hand over to Gillian um, to talk about our um, second challenge that, that comes up all, all the time, like how do we align our purpose and culture to create value for stakeholders? And just to add, Gillian is bringing both her experience as CEO of the Muller Institute, where she was for 24 years, embedding values to develop a service-led organization and leadership institute. In addition to her CEO hat, she's also served on several boards and done her own research, her own master's research into, um, into um, some of these topics as well. So I have to apologize. Unfortunately, we have no video for Gillian. She's had some internet challenges today. Um, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to hear her and she can take us through challenge number two, aligning purpose and culture to create value for stakeholders. So over to you, Gillian. My personal purpose um, really was founded when I was a youngster. Um, it's all about growing and helping others to be at their best. The origins really from my family home as a family of entrepreneurs where we had a business, our own business of growing uh, and a wholesaler for flowers and salad ingredients. And really a family with hard work and business going on all hand in hand, where we, we very much grew up with respect for people and with respect for nature. So that really was what founded my purpose. The thought that I could help and be part of something that's growing, helping people and businesses to grow and really supporting others to be at their best. And I've had the wonderful opportunity in my career to be able to do that and particularly at Moller, where I've been able to help to develop the team there and to develop the senior leaders and the high potential leaders in the classroom. And obviously also working alongside my own family. So my energy and my motivation grows and follows through from my purpose. And at the Institute, the organizational purpose was very much founded from the Muller Institute, where the, Do the Muller Foundation, uh, where the donation originally came from to Churchill College. And Merck McKinney Muller, the benefactor, wanted to uh, bring all that Cambridge had to offer to benefit business and wider society. And so his purpose in establishing the Muller Institute was to do just that. The purpose and values of the MESC organization and my own values, we combined those together to very much uh, develop a, an organizational purpose that we could line ourselves behind, align our strategy to and deliver. The values of the organization were obviously critical and um, I'm delighted to now be in a role where you know, values are also uh, central to what I'm doing, and that's no surprise. And they're also central to the Cambridge leadership model here at CISL. The values at Moller were also an important part of what we did. And really, they led the way we did things, they influenced our strategy, and they influenced the way in which we delivered value to stakeholders. And our purpose at Moller, to inspire individuals to be the best that they can be, to accelerate the performance of the organizations which they serve and to have a positive impact on society and the environment. And through our work covenanting profits to Churchill College to support the education of future leaders. This was our purpose and one that was really good to align behind and still is for all the team and the staff uh, and the stakeholders. So our customer promise, you are at the heart of everything we do. This was our tangible way of making this real for us. It was a statement that we promised to our customers and we later adapted it so that we were promising it to our staff as well. You are at the heart of everything we do. And that means that nothing's too much trouble. We want to be there for you uh, and support you in your development and your growth. So this made it tangible for us and helped us to influence the day-to-day -day work of this Institute through our customer promise our purpose and our values. And finally, culture. Culture does stand the test of time and it helps to provide consistency and confidence for the clients. It needs to be evolving, it needs to be agile, and it needs to support the delivery of the purpose and the strategy. 
but you know you can influence culture more than you realize and I think you know, it's very interesting if you look at the headings on this slide these are the ways that you can look to influence culture both as a leader and as an individual in an organization thinking about the stories that get told what gets celebrated the systems the structures and the symbols and rituals that take place in the organization and where the power lies and how the leaders actually behave and obviously my behavior as the CEO was very important in influencing that culture and taking it in the direction that we wanted to deliver our purpose and our customer promise but of course we don't always get it right but the influence and the noticing of what we're doing and really looking to see if we're achieving that is important and that's why I just wanted to end with measures because it's important to know whether you're delivering what you're promising to your customers and we looked at key areas and still do in terms of those uh, external audits, uh, ISO and hospitality assured, but most importantly, the business results and if we're delivering to the shareholders and stakeholders. And finally, to think about very much uh, what the staff are saying about us and what the clients are saying about us. Are our clients happy? Do they really believe we're delivering what we promise? And that's absolutely essential in terms of really measuring that your purpose and values are really meaningful and that they're not just words on a paper. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you so much, Gillian. Um, so moving on to the third of our five challenges that, we, that we've heard from you all is how do we unlock finance and innovation for a sustainable economy? And um, I'd like to now hand back to Ibrahim, um, who's got a few thoughts on this. Ibrahim, over to you. Thank you. Uh, this global crisis that we are living, all living now, I think it's, it provides us with uh, a, an amazing opportunity to take a step back and rethink the existing business models we have and maybe identify some gaps and, and opportunities. Why, will, why would we need to do this? There will be a, a competition on finance and investment, but there will be also an opportunity to access uh, stimulus plans, support investments in uh, the new direction after post-COVID-19. Post One of the good things that we've done is tackling into green finances. Green finances is an opportunity for people to, uh, to identify uh, doing well by doing good, or public-private par partnership, or private-private partnership. In the region, uh, we issue usually Sukuk. Sukuk is a Sharia compliance bond, so it's a bond, uh, but uh, the difference is it follows the Islamic Sharia when it comes to investment. Uh, we decided to be bold and issue the global first benchmark for green Sukuk, building on two things. One, we are a reputable uh, uh, privately uh, rated, uh, privately held rated company. And the second part, for the last 10 years, we've been investing and spending uh, in green investments, such as green buildings and going into green certifications and tackling our climate change impact and making it as at the heart of everything we do. Having a helicopter view of everything, so you look at it not as a sustainability practitioner only, you look at it from finance, development, future, corporate development, as well as sustainability. I'm proud of this special, this, this uh, launch because I was very, very close with an amazing partner of crime in the organization, the head of treasury. We never thought as a CSO works with the treasury and finance. Actually, we, we in the, the project plan was, was five months and we did it in five weeks instead because we aligned uh, the target and our clear objectives. We had the previous history, and in, in, in a span of uh, almost six months, we did two issuance for two, two green uh, sukuks, uh, $600, $600 million each, and uh, we were over uh, subscribed by a, an average five to six times. So we, we raised $1.2 billion, and at the same time, we had an interest of more than $3.5 billion just for investors uh, in, interested to do in green Sukuk. And by the way, most of it is not your usual suspects. Most of them, they were investors, but they had a demand of their customers. And because of the lack of supply, we were there. So the demand was there and there was an opportunity and that was late last year. So it wasn't 
uh, it was there was uncertainty in the uh, financial market so this is one of the things that a good example to tackle the other one is maybe the uh, uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 uh, made it clearer uh, food and food security people were worried about lots of things their health and well-being and most importantly with the lockdown in most of the countries in the world they were worried if they can put food on the table with their jobs and the uh, food and not any food we're talking about organic and healthy food so what we've done we had we just built on a great relationship we have with the local markets the local farmers and the small smes and we thought of what we can transfer what about can transfer our retail outlets our supermarkets into a small neighborhood farm so the plan we did it with a pilot and we started so far with three hydroponics uh, farms and where we saved around 90 percent of water we reduce our carbon footprint because there is no transport the customers can look at it and see how does it grow if we're taking care of it or not and most importantly it's it's healthy as well and it provides a healthy diet to the customer so it's, it's we we took care of the planet and we took care of the profit and most importantly we took care of people especially now about uh, with their will be and their diet that's two examples about how you can and of course sky is the limit when you take a helicopter point of view you see things you never thought and you could tackle thank you Brilliant. Thank you, Ibrahim. Two fantastic examples of unlocking finance and unlocking innovation. And I think unlocking $1.2 billion uh, worth of green finance is um, certainly a super proof point. So moving on to our fourth challenge, getting buy-in from the board for long-term goals. As I mentioned earlier, Gillian has got the benefit not only of, with her CEO hat on, but having served on a number of boards and also actually done her own research a part of her her masters and and Gillian, i think you've got um seven six six key points you wanted to cover here in terms of how do we get buying from the board for long-term goals over short-term priorities thank you zoe so my research and the work i've been doing and my experience really focuses on how does sustainability emerge at the board level how does it come up and looking at this through the eyes of the CEO and the senior leader in the organization, I've discovered that there are really six very key points that I'd like to share with you this morning. First of all, framing is key. Framing as risk and opportunity is really important at the board. The risk of the supply of resources and the risk to the business of not taking heed of the long term and thinking about consumer and market pressures. And on the other hand, the opportunity that the sustainability agenda presents us, how we can innovate to create the value and to seize that opportunity to develop new products and services and to change the business model or the value chain in order to take that advantage. Point number two. We must admit here that it's a balancing act. Looking at the short term and the long term priorities is always going to be a balancing act. And this is really challenging for the chief exec and for the board. And one chief exec that I interviewed actually said to me, you know, to be honest, unless you deliver in the short term, you really don't earn the right to deliver in the long term or to even make those decisions. And this is really playing out right now for every board across the country and the world. Really helping to balance the two together and thinking about how delivering in the short term can also help you to take those steps to deliver in the long term and to think about those risks and opportunities. And so this is really important that we can show value in both and that they can both support each other to take the business in the right direction and in a sustainable direction. So point number three, context is everything and timing is critical. And we really do have a very current situation where this is so relevant. Think about what else is on the agenda at the board. Think about this carefully and think about what you're putting your decisions up against for that board to, to decide what's going on at the time. Where is the focus of the board and what's on their mind? And make sure that your proposals speak to these issues and make sure that they're relevant. And the situation we're in with COVID demonstrates that you know we can be flexible and flex and move forward differently 
in order to adapt and change because we're being forced to do that. And so really thinking about the context and timing at the moment for boards, how can this opportunity be used to do things differently, to contribute to those long-term projects and to make step-by-step -step journeys towards a more sustainable business? Let's make sure they don't get overlooked and make sure that the conversion back to business isn't necessarily business as usual, but business that can take us towards a more sustainable agenda while still getting the value of creation back on the road as quickly as possible. We do need to balance, it's a both and, not an either or, short term and long term. Point number four, let's not talk about sustainability in its own right, but let's integrate it into the core strategy so that it becomes business as usual. And those CEOs where the business had incorporates the sustainability agenda into the strategy so that it was just the way things got done, how to create new opportunities to create value and the new norm. This was the best way of actually taking the agenda further, making it business as usual, making it part of the everyday day to day, but also part of the core strategy in terms of the development of products and services and the overall direction and vision of the organization. So moving to point number five, back to the original purpose and values. These were very much uh, used and came up in the, the conversations I had with CEOs that they were incredibly important and helpful at the board in terms of making decisions and having discussions. They were used as a barometer for guidance when those tough decisions have got to be made and how to implement those changes. So purpose and values are very much shared, a common understanding across the whole organization and the whole stakeholder group, so that those decisions and conversations can have some consistency in terms of what has to be made. Finally, point six, thinking about our stakeholders and our shareholders, our customers and our staff, and the community, of course. They all have a point of view and they all have the chance to influence the board agenda if you communicate with them and keep them on board and see what they think. And don't underestimate the influence that the chief executive has as an individual and the values and purpose that he or she has and that they bring to the board table. Those behaviours and values can make a difference in the way they role model and lead the organisation and show up at the board and can have a lasting contribution on the way things move forward in those decisions. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Gillian. So we're moving on to our fifth and final challenge uh, that we hear most often. And um, I'm gonna go back to Ibrahim for this one. And this is breaking through gridlock. How do we break through gridlock to influence change both within our organizations and beyond? And I know, um, Ibrahim, you've got a, a couple of points that you want to mention and before we go to questions. So, so over to you. Ibrahim, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're, you're on mute. I mute myself, apologies. Um, you know, a uh, growing uh, number of people uh, think the answer is to call on the big businesses to help fix the economic and social problems. But we still face enormous social, environmental, and economic challenges as well. Like let's, and we forget sometimes the small main details that we missed while doing that. Talk about let's talk about low-hanging fruit. Let's talk about serious uh, problems such as uh, water, for example. Water, more than a quarter of all humankind lack access to even uh, the most. Uh, basic elements such as water clean water and this has been part of the sdgs been part of been talked about it's for me this is a pandemic for example and this is it has numbers has database as well as it can open uh, uh, a floor and a platform for smes uh, and uh, uh, help them to even to to survive uh, the existing and economic situation we have so Big companies depend on the SMEs for innovations. So we need to understand and accept the fact that SMEs and big companies are in, the, they're in this together. And something we learned, by the way, living this, uh, uh, living this time now, if one of us falls, we all fall. And this is something we're all in agreement, the whole world in agreement. It's something 
COVID-19 did something, it, came, it brought the whole world together. We are all in this together. So breaking the, the, to break uh, the unlocks or uh, to open something for the benefits of the business and the planet and the people, uh, now we all understand uh, it's a fact that if one of us, of us falls, we all fall. Also, prevention is better than cure. If we talk about uh, small businesses, if we talk about climate change, if we're talking about uh, food uh, and uh, proper sustainable solutions, it's part of a prevention and part of risk and compliance now. Uh, also, in addition to what Gillian uh, added as well, uh, mentioned about balancing, the public now uh, needs to understand and learn more uh, about the gravity of the situation. Uh, having short sentences about and general sentence about a crisis or about a challenge is not enough anymore for any stakeholder, be it a board of directors or a CEO or you just your 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 customer. Also, we need to link now. Uh, we have an opportunity to link with uh, global focus. So if, again, if we what we're living now, we have the power of global focus. So we're not thinking of a local part only. We're talking of being part of the global community. And I tell you something, I, I, I think we should use as well. Think to listen to the experts. We all now listen to doctors and scientists for, uh, uh, to find a cure and a vaccine. We can use exactly the same thing for any other big factual based on scientific uh, approach. And most importantly, I would say towards the end of uh, uh, how you follow your true north. Uh, personally, uh, I, I made sure that this is my true north, what I do right now, and it, it did not only benefit me, it benefited the company I serve, the community I am part of, and most importantly, the planet I live on. So that is in a nutshell uh, how you can unlock it. But most importantly, again, don't forget to follow your true north. Brilliant. Thank you, Ibrahim. What a perfect place on which to end. And as I said, we wanted to make sure we had lots and lots of time for questions. We've covered an awful lot of ground in less than 30 minutes. So thank you both so much for that. And lovely to see the response in the chat and see that um, a lot of this is resonating. So moving on to questions, I'm actually gonna shop, stop sharing this deck and we are going to see whether the wind is blowing in the right direction and we might even be able to get an image of uh, Gillian um, on, our, on our screens as well. Um, let's see how we do. Fantastic, wonderful, super. So, um, as I mentioned at the outset, we've we've got had over sixty questions in advance, and uh, we also want to make sure that we we get the opportunity to respond to some of the the comments and questions that you're putting in the chat. So do please keep on doing that, and uh, we'll we'll keep on on monitoring that as well. Um, so. Uh, Gillian, I just wanted to um, um, turn to you first, if I may. And you know, when it comes to aligning purpose and culture to creating value for stakeholders, you know, obviously, as you can imagine, we had a lot of questions in this area. And, and um, one that I, I wanted to touch on because we've not we've not covered it yet, really, is is the whole aspect of continuous learning, learning and development and training. And, and the question was. Now, how do you enable continuous learning, um, particularly when training and, and L&D is often the first budget cut in times of uncertainty? So just interested in, in, in your personal experience of, of how, you've, how you've enabled um, learning and training when it comes to building in purpose into our culture. I think the important thing there is using all the opportunities that you have available to you when, when budgets are limited. And, really giving people projects and work to do that's going to stretch them and give them opportunities to learn and grow and also mentoring and coaching throughout that process so that the individual has the chance to feel open to ask questions and to really discover their own place in this learning but also the skill that they're developing and give them the responsibility and the accountability so that they can really you know test their muscle and grow into that and those opportunities are there in the workplace every day 
and you know if you have an organizational purpose and values that that support growth and learning this is an easy thing to do and it, it's difficult obviously in business pressures but actually it pays dividends in the long run brilliant thank you so much Julian and just just a second second question there around you know, on the whole topic of of how do we align um, our purpose to create value for all stakeholders just just on the staff piece again um, just just really your thoughts on on how how do we communicate so we had a question that came in advance you know how do we how do we keep staff motivated um, during during difficult times like we're, we're in at the moment you know what's the role that 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 culture plays in embedding sustainability. So, so perhaps just your thought on thoughts or, or what's worked for you when it comes to communicating with staff. I think really, you know, keeping staff engaged and, and, and understanding what's happening is really important. Communicating, communicating, and then communicating some more so that they really are clear about what's happening and the difficult decisions that are having to be faced so that the, they has a, there's a transparency around what's going on and, and the fear of the unknown um, you know, can be dealt with because that's always very difficult when things are going through uncertainties. Nobody knows what all the answers are, but if they feel that they have your trust, that you have their back and you're with them to keep them in the picture along the way um, and very much aligned with the values and purpose of the organization, then I think that really helps individuals to feel reassured and they know that the decisions you're taking uh, they can be reassured even if they're difficult short term that they've really thinking about the long term uh, survival of the organization and the, this stuff you know for the for the future brilliant that that's that's really helpful thank you so much um now needless to say i'm going to turn to you on, for this one ibrahim um a lot of the questions that have been woven in are, are, are related to um the challenge of leading in a in a pandemic and I should first say, actually, I meant to say that this, this at the outset, that we, we call this, this webinar um, Leadership Dilemmas and Solutions. And I want to put a big caveat on that. There are not solutions to some of the problems that we're facing. So you know, this is very much around approaches, you know, what's worked for, for you in your context. So, so just interested, Ibrahim, in terms of some of the, the challenges. Um, couple of questions that, that we had related to responding in, into a, uh, to a, a pandemic and I'll, I'll put a, a few of those to you and, and feel free to respond. Um, firstly, what recommendations would you make for leaders as we navigate the next phase of this pandemic and stay true to the promise of change? And actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there rather than load you up with too many questions. Thank you. Um, so we, 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 as a business, we, we have done a lot of work uh, to, to ensure the sustainability and the continuity of the business, either from uh, uh, compliance and risk assessments. And uh, the main uh, flagship that we did uh, a risk assessment on is, of course, climate change. But having said that, we looked at the people and the people were said. So part of the uh, uh, main focus of our uh, uh, sustainability strategy is to transform the lives of the people we serve, either their staff or the 500 million plus customers that we serve. Uh, so uh, we look at it, of course, it's been a challenge, uh, what we live right now, the COVID-19 has been a global challenge. You've seen some global uh, big countries, uh, they were uh, uh, not under the uh, uh, expectations of their own people, while you see other small countries as well, uh, they've done a great job. Uh, also, you see two main uh, or three main different opinions on how to deal with it. As a company, we made sure, again, what's the clear objective? The clear objective is one, our own people, the health and safety of our own people, and, and also the economic stability of the people. So we assured that, one, the staff won't lose their income, so they don't need to worry. We don't need to add more mental uh, pressure on them as the mental pressure we already have. Then we provided a platform, we utilized on, we did simulation on similar cases and we utilized it for the pandemic. A good example of a whistleblower hotline, we use a, a mental uh, hotline for the staff in case they need any psychological support done by experts with all privacy. The other part is the reskilling using our leadership institute, the investment of people in the 
to the, the education, the uh, uh, extracurricular education or the leadership programs that we had, uh, the investment in digital and technology that we did. So we did not only uh, rely on, as the whole world, on uh, uh, digital media to talk as we're doing right now, but also in record time, the same programs that we offered um, physically in our leadership institute, in a week time, it was the same courses, we had it online. So uh, first of all, what we did, we trusted the experts that we have in the organization. And when you do that, when you trust an expert, when you listen to them, you can take any or manage uh, and help you in the agility of a challenge. Also, we worked on the behavioral change. Uh, we did change behavior. We embedded the culture of the organization. We, are, we have the togetherness and uh, uh, the happiness, the uh, bold uh, values. We have the passion. Uh, passion is part of our values. So we, change, we needed to change behavior of our, customer, of our staff to embed it in the customer experience of our own uh, uh, visitors. Also, now data is the new cash, and we all know that. Since day one, we started collecting uh, data on the behavior of internal, external, what's happening in the world to have a baseline. The minute you have a baseline, then you can manage, you can, you can make your decisions in challenging times based on facts and figures. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Ibrahim. So much in there. Um, and uh, interesting to see the point about culture and values coming through. And I love your point about listening to the experts as well. Um, I think it, for me, it ties back to what you were saying about um, thinking about all different types of stakeholders, the point Gillian made as well, and uh, your reference to unusual, unusual suspects. So, so thank you. Lots and lots of um, useful useful content in there and, and the point about digital and technology is actually something we talked about quite a bit in our last webinar so thank you um Gillian I wanted to turn back to you because there was a, a specific question we had about millennials um when it came to um culture and, and, and values and and leadership and I know that this is something that you're really passionate about in terms of aspiring leaders and how do we support as aspiring leaders um, and I just wondered, um, you know, what your thoughts are in terms of aspiring leaders. Um, and the question specifically that we got was, what are the, what are the key leadership topics that, that matter for millennials? So um, just your thoughts in general, really, about, you know, how, how, we, how we support that group. Well, I think that group really want to have access to a lot of knowledge and a lot of information and a lot of opportunity. They really want to get their hands dirty, get in there and, and, and actually um, experience things for themselves. They want a lot of feedback and they want quite a lot of attention and, and access so that they can learn from that, so that they can grow from that. And they really want the opportunity to, to move quickly through at pace uh, and to you know work in their way that they've developed through the technological age that they've grown up in. So they have very different ways of doing things and different aspirations, but you know it's important that we harness that and, and turn that to their advantage, but also help them to understand the other elements of, of leadership and so on. So really giving them those opportunities to be accountable and to take responsibility early, but making sure that we give them attention and feedback and we're very candid with them because what they really want is, is transparency and honesty. But also they want to be working towards something that has a purpose, that has a, a value beyond just the cash value of the work. They want to feel they're making a contribution. And I think that's particularly important and relevant on this uh, occasion when we're really focusing on the sustainability agenda. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. And I, I think that also ties back to Ibrahim's earlier point about now, how do we make sure that our, our, our people can continue to make um, a contribution? And, and Ibrahim, your example of, of, of reskilling and, and redeploying some of your teams. Um, Ibrahim, we've got a question in the chat from Antonio um, from Brazil. So, so welcome, Antonio. Um, and, and he's picking up on your point about resilience again. Um, so an opportunity to reflect on that. And, and his question is, you, know, you talked about resilience to overcome this global crisis. But I would like you to talk a little bit more about how to be resilient and adaptive. Is it possible for a regular person 
to become resilient. And and I think, I mean, this this one is interesting to me because I remember when we were preparing for this this webinar, you 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 were quite frank about how you'd had to dig deep to become more resilient and and more adaptive through this through this process. And and wondered what your top tips were really in terms of becoming more resilient, so that we can share those with Antonio. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, I think uh, uh, living a pandemic now uh, shows uh, uh, the, how you can invest in yourself and how you can uh, work hard to, to, to stay standing as, as an individual. Uh, we're survivors. And if we think about it as on this planet, we had, you think of having no choice. First of all, since day one, um, I, I, I truly believe that we can and we should imagine options for a sustainable future. So there is a light in the end of the tunnel. We know that we, we can have a sustainable future. And I looked at it and I've seen people uh, discussing it and relating it to other pandemics. Uh, I, I remember a tweet for uh, the former president, US President Barack Obama, when uh, he mentioned that we are living a pandemic now. Uh, this uh, we cannot afford. And he said, we cannot afford having any more consequences of climate denial. This is preparing it. Think, and he, he, he talked about the young people. Um, the thing we've done is you look, you look, you need to, de to dive deep into your skills. Um, uh, personally, in the last three months, uh, I, 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 I learned and I studied health and safety, for example. And you, you implement it on your construction side. And it's the same principle, but you need to think of it of a bigger picture, taking a helicopter view, as I've mentioned. And implementing the same principles you need to stop you need to assess and think the source of the problem and have a clear objective and then you act the minute you have these three points you stop think and act you become a, a, a resilient by default because you're ready uh, and you don't rebound and you don't you're not rebounding and don't become reactive instead of proactive so that's an important what I, I learned as well as uh, having a long-term strategy on uh, compliances and risk assessments and be ready. You have to be ready. Uh, you need to think of the impact you are you're having or your stakeholders having and have a strategy for it, even a high level one, and to implement it uh, in a later stage. You should have something there. And again, uh, we have the baseline, uh, we have the data, you can utilize the data and uh, you can change behavior as well, as I've mentioned before. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. I think sort of listen, stop, think, and act are sort of key, key pieces that's, of that's, advice. You know, that's, that's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a scuba diver. That's the first thing they teach you to save your life. In case of any crisis underwater, you need to stop, think, and act. And that saves your life. So take that principle and put it on real life. Absolutely. I think that, that metaphor works. I'm sure many people have felt underwater over the last few weeks. Um, I'm going to pose a question and, and perhaps Gillian, you might want to, to, to come, in, come in on this one. Um, just picking up on, the, on this listening piece for a minute there. So, so one of the questions we got in advance was how, how do I encourage listener, how do I encourage leaders to listen and act on feedback? Now, I know that you've, you've um, also done work in terms of coaching. Um, I'm sure that you've you know, coached, coached many people, not, not just um, in your roles on boards. But I, I just wondered what your top thoughts were in how do we, how do we encourage leaders to listen? And I'm wondering if that came up in your, in your research around boards, just that piece of actually absorbing um, different stakeholder perspectives. Thank you, Zoya. Yeah, I think really listening is, in, is so important and I think it's particularly powerful if the feedback comes direct from the individual or stakeholder group that's actually wanting the feedback to resonate because if you're faced with a face-to-face -face conversation or with a focus group of people giving you feedback, it becomes very real. And if they give real examples of the impact of, of that, that behavior and what's happening as a consequence with data and evidence to support that, then I think it becomes a very real thing for the leader. And it's very hard to ignore that. 
if there's evidence and data to show the impact of what's happening, then it's very difficult to then say, well, actually, I'm not going to hear you. So two things. One is make sure you've got the evidence and data and the case story to make it real. But secondly, if you can, really try and, and get those individuals who want to give that feedback, uh, either as a focus group or as an individual face to face, because I think that's really powerful. And then you don't just get the, the head side of it. You also get the emotional side and that connection with what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Thank you so much. Now, and I think that that's probably the same answer from one of the questions that we had in the chat, which was you know, around this whole topic of breaking through gridlock. If, if sustainability is seen as a fad, what is the best way to start the conversations with senior leaders? So I think, Gillian, your point about how do we make it real? How do we get other stakeholders involved? How do we ensure that they, they're connecting both at a, a head and heart level? I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add, Gillian, to that. Well, I think if, if you have the opportunity where you're trying to influence somebody who thinks it's a fad, if you have the opportunity to get the data and to look forward and see the impact of, of, of this uh, organisation or individual not listening, um, I think it becomes very, very powerful. And also, if you can be creative and think innovatively in your organisation, what could you be doing different to take an opportunity from the, the sustainability agenda, both uh, either economically, environmentally, or from a societal perspective, and start thinking about innovative ways of doing that and put something on the table, a product or a service that might create value, then it becomes very real and it's very hard for someone not to listen if it's a way to create value for the organisation. Yeah, and Ibrahim, I think this ties into what you were talking earlier about. I know you talk about low hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, I, I completely agree with Gillian as well, and I think I uh, would add to it, um, I, we may have uh, lots of low hanging fruits post COVID-19, although I'm a bit worried about a revenge pollution uh, similar to what happened in 2008 after uh, uh, the recession we had, and then the stimulus plans, the government started to invest heavily in development just uh, uh, all over the world. but. Low hanging fruits, of course, uh, we can use exactly what we, we always use. You look at, you need to translate the sustainability language we have into the language I use with the treasurer, with the CEO, or the CFO. You need to show uh, your cost savings, you need to show your long term profitability, you need to show your corporate citizenship. Young people now, young people are not only your staff, they're your customers, they're the decision makers. They will demand to have a corporate, to see a corporate citizenship. And most importantly as well, the brand reputation. The brand now, we look at, you talk about agility and resilience. Now, within COVID-19, with the pandemic that we're living, we've seen a couple of companies going all the way on the roof with shares, and we've seen some companies, uh, the credibility of the companies, of the way they handled with their own people. So if you invest in people before and invest in people now, it, become into, it will reflect on your financial sheets. And again, uh, we have a baseline, and use the data. Uh, to, 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 again, uh, post COVID-19, I believe lots of opportunities. Uh, low hanging fruits is the first thing to start with. And by the way, you don't need to go far away for a low hanging fruit. Just look around and provide solution that is good for the community, good for yourself, makes doing well by doing good. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Slightly different question now. Um, and, and Ibrahim, perhaps we'll, we'll start with your thoughts. Some top tips for leading in a virtual environment across cultures. Uh, you talked about the scale of your operation at the beginning. Um, you, you're such a such an incredible organisation across so many areas. Be interested and countries, markets. Be interested in your thoughts. Again, I think flexibility is uh, is, is a good tip. Um, the, the, since day one created uh, to deal a, a business continuity committee with a crisis management committee we we isolated the decision making for countries so instead of taking a longer time it takes shorter time now empowering people empowering our people work really really well with us because uh, they know better so uh, also the uh, digital and investment education we did uh, we transferred into our offices on the spot to homes. So technically, we did not stop operations. Actually, I was listening yesterday to uh, uh, a webinar in the World Government Summit uh, where 
where uh, one of the speakers mentioned uh, that the new workplace now is at home or somewhere else. Uh, an average, Cisco CEO mentioned that an average uh, of 10 hours a day, uh, a staff is spending on WebEx now, which is trust, very trusted by governments. So we're talking about public sector, uh, 10 full hours working on either they have to or they want to, but still their, their efficiency is higher. So investing uh, in the future and technology is a future, adding it to flexibility, and main, most importantly, investing in your own people. That's, that's uh, the tip in virtual and not virtual. It always works. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm juggling the fact that we've got loads of questions coming through on the chat. <laughs> got lots of questions in advance and four minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose some of the questions and I'm going to give you the opportunity to just uh, spend a minute on the, the question of your choice so that you don't feel um so many um so you don't feel put on the spot well firstly by the way i would also like to say that we're getting some lovely feedback so for example eugenio said he has to go but thank you very much for the great insights about leadership and values so so people are, are very much appreciating this conversation um so question that we had um that i'd, I'd love your thoughts on um perhaps one for you prim and, and one for you Gillian. So, so firstly, uh, for you, Gillian, um, sort of picking up again on, on, on sort of your board perspective, how do you navigate the short term pressure in your example from the board and protect the well-being of employees? And just so that I can give Ibrahim the heads up on on the question that, that is then going to come to him, which is not all of us have access to boards and CEOs and how can we lead for sustainability within our peer group, which I think is probably a great question on which to end. So, so Gillian, just, just that, that, that first one for you. I think probably the most important thing in a difficult context like we have at the moment is to really trust your staff to, to deliver and help you find the solutions. Uh, don't feel it has to be done in a closed room, but actually engage them and help them and trust them and their skills to actually help to find those solutions. But also, you know, there are there are going to be some situations where staff are furloughed and people are not at work, and that's always very difficult. How do you maintain the well-being of those staff who are still working and maybe who are not working during that process? And I think that's a real challenge for organisations at the moment. But what I would say is that, you know, communication is really important at this time. And, and well-being is grounded in people feeling some sense of connection, some sense of community, uh, some sense of compassion and understanding of the situation they're in. So being able to understand what decisions are being made and what the organization's going through and staying connected with those employees is really important for their well-being. And also helping them to use their time if they're not fully engaged in work in a way that's developmental for them, that helps them to grow in other ways and helps them to keep fully engaged and occupied in a creative way, even if it's not necessarily within the workplace. So really it's around Brilliant. trust, good communication and, and engaging as much as possible and checking in all the time. Lovely, thank you Gillian and just just one last one to put in the mix Ibrahim which I think is a um, an, an extension of the, the, the one I just posed to you. So one minute left. Um, so we've had the point in the chat so many financial decisions pivot on the price of oil. How do we influence when so much is out of our control? So I think that relates to the other question. How do we influence wherever we are within our within our context? Final thoughts for you before I close? Well, it's, it's a journey. It's a 1,000 mile journey. And uh, we have to understand that. We're not, uh, it's like any other investments, by the way. If you look at sustainability, it's, it should be embedded in the business. We definitely, people now demands, customer demands, everyone demands that. Even the global government, they signed an SDG, they signed an Paris Agreement. People are, are fully aware. And again, what we are living right now, and we, with what what crisis, what climate crisis we had, what different crises we had, it showed that agility, it's the main part of the businesses. Business want to stay around, and we saw lots of companies ignored this, and they just disappeared, by the way. They did not, they were not agile, they were not, they were not investing in the future, and this is what we're talking about, is part of the future. Where you can start with the first step, I am 100% sure each company, a human resource department, a marketing department, they do small steps, and this is where it started. This is most of, look at the big giants where sustainability started. 
and then you do the education. It's a small step. We are, we are aiming for a net positive. But 10 years ago, we started with a humble idea of the staff if we can do a green mall, a green certified mall. So what we're talking about, a net positive now, started long time ago with an engineer and a project management to say, I would like, I can save money by doing a green mall. So it starts, you have to understand that it's a thousand mile journey. It will need a lot of uh, persistence. It needs a lot of education. And lucky for us now, as we said at the beginning is, and I will, I will uh, wrap it up here. Um, uh, one of the other sides of COVID-19 business as usual is officially dead, no longer exists. So there is an opportunity to, 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 to be part of the definition of the new business model. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. What a lovely point on which to end. The journey starts with the first step and education is a fundamentally important part of that. Certainly something that we believe very strongly at CISL. So I would like to close the webinar now and um, firstly thank everybody who's joining us live. Thank everybody who will be watching this recording afterwards. And we know that we had over 950 people registered um, in watching this webinar. So um, there'll be a lot of people that will be looking for the recording afterwards. So welcome um, to thank both our guests, um, Julian and Ibrahim. Um, Ibrahim forgot to mention that he actually launched a book last week, which was How to Net Positive. Um, and we'll be sending a follow up email to everybody just in terms of how to access how to access this webinar and what else is available from uh, CISL. So a massive thank you um, to all of you who joined and to Gillian and Ibrahim um, for being with us today. So thank you all very much indeed and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, thank you. Sarah.